<laughs> All right, we are live and also we are recording. It's going good. And we already have what uh, dozens of participants on the line. So uh, welcome everybody uh, to the pre-show. Uh, what is it called? Uh, like in, in, a, in an NFL game, tailgating? Uh, what do they call this? Like pre-show entertainment, right? Is the tailgate party? Is that what it? What this is? Yeah, we're, this is the tailgate party, mm -hmm. and uh, we're I, all I wish this was a tailgate party. I would not be having water currently. But. This is water. Where? That's not water, dude. You're in Colorado. Don't even try it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, welcome this is everybody. Only an hour. We'll be kicking off the webinar in uh, what 15 minutes and. Uh, in the meanwhile, we'll just be chit-chatting, right? So, guys, I actually uh, thought of putting a curveball question uh, here in front of the uh, front of the webinar slides, but since we have 15 minutes, we should actually cover that without the slides. So, and raise your hands to talk again. Uh, let's practice this. So, uh, name name one thing that uh, is the most crucial to you, or n not, not necessarily most crucial, but name one thing that's really important for, uh, for good high-density Wi-Fi, or one sure way to fail high-density Wi-Fi. Todd Simon. Obstructions. What yeah. about? Uh, well, if you, wanna, if you wanna have bad Wi-Fi, have lots of them. If you wanna have great Wi-Fi, have none. Yeah. Sounds fair. What sort of, uh, um, Marcus? <laughs> yeah, I would say to have great high density Wi-Fi, you need to have the APs as close to the people as possible, but then also have the APs not be able to hear APs next to them. So that's uh, kind of crucial. Yeah, I would agree because that really comes down to location, right? Location, 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 where can you mount them? You don't always get the choice of where they are, where you need them to be versus where there's literally something you can stick them on. Yeah, I definitely yes. agree with Marcus on that. You know, when you start to talk about high density, it's, it's more than one thing, but it's, you know, providing that high RSSI for clients to negotiate a higher QAM. And then the second thing, channel isolation and reuse, right? So those are the two big things that I've seen. I mean, I think part of the reason why you're trying to yeah. be close to those, one of the biggest challenges in high density is maintaining SNR. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, there's, there's useful obstructions as well. If you think, you know, people are basically just portable RF attenuators when you put them in the seats. <laughs> oh, wait, Josh, oh, Very true. Man, in our presentation, he talks about... Uh, RFK. Yeah, I, I definitely get into uh, the, the number of decibels of my beer gut. Uh, <laughs> so last year yeah. I was somewhere in the 12 to 15 dB range this year I think I'm up to 20. Very important to calibrate your uh, testers including your test equipment. <laughs> it's a moving target man it depends on uh, <laughs> a number of factors. Yeah, and I think one of the things that can really get to it and make it so hard to come up with things like a best practice is just because every location is different, right? You can expect a lot of office buildings will be pretty similar. Every arena, every stadium, they're just all one-offs. They're all completely different. And a lesson you might learn in one doesn't necessarily apply at the next one you go to. I think that's why the uh, the funny answer when people ask you questions with Wi-Fi is uh, is is always starts with well it depends. Exactly. <laughs> people love that it answer. Depends. Well, it depends. Yeah. I think Samuel Clements actually is going to present uh, at WLPC a presentation called "It Depends" on that exact topic. I kid you not. That's the that's the title of the presentation. That's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Another thing, I guess, to preempt, we're still in the pre-show here, but it's very important that people don't take recommendations for high density and then apply it to like a sparse office or something like that because you're just setting yourself up for uh, client connectivity issues. I see it sometimes. We're like, well, your VRD says, you know, to do this. I'm like, yeah, but that's when we have, you know, an AP every thousand square feet. You've got an AP every 3,000 square feet. So be careful. We're talking high density here. This is lots of people, 
lots of seats, butts and seats. We try to um, we try to tell people, you know, the different features and, and things that you can use and the knobs you can turn. But then we also, to your point, try to tell them, you know, the degree to which you use these knobs is going to vary is going to vary depending on where you're at. So if you're in a stadium, you might be pretty aggressive. If you're in a you know education or a convention center or a mall, I mean, same knobs but turn to a different spot. Right. Yeah. And Matt, I think uh, that goes along with RxSOP, right? Well, that's one of the knobs, yeah, that I was basically uh, alluding to. So yeah, I mean, you can that that that's a that's one that, you know, you can get a lot of usefulness out of and you can cut your arm off at the same time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, those. That was a really good point. Like what works in a stadium doesn't work anywhere else. So uh, don't try necessarily at home. So you mentioned uh, RX. SOP and what is this called in the Aruba world? It was um, uh, CSR reduction. Yeah. What's that? CSR cell size reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rockus. Yeah, we would be talking about that with the uh, the cell size. That's right. And the gist of that is basically detuning the sensitivity of the radio to you know drop signals below a threshold, their earmuffs for an AP. Mm -hmm. You can get in trouble with that getting too aggressive where APs will start causing collisions in the air because they don't hear the other AP. So you, that's a, a cautionary thing, uh, specifically in <laughs> other places, right? Yeah, I think there's also, um, it's, it's very important to understand how the different vendors implement these features. You know, the, uh, the Aruba feature here, cell size reduction, is effectively a delta of the noise floor, as I understand it. With Cisco, it's a brick, fill, it's a brick wall that you hit, you set it at a static value. So, you know, it can react differently in a different environment. So uh, really understanding what you're playing with there is very important. It's quite often yeah. why a lot of these features are buried nicely in the CLI or under the you know more advanced menu options just to keep them out of reach of the <laughs> Yes. Well, and what works in one place is going to work elsewhere, right? What you're doing in the seats may be very different from the bowl where you might have, where it's much more open. You've got a line of sight really far away. You can hear things from very far away versus even the club rooms, right? Or the concourses or something like that. You can't actually take a one size fits all approach to how you're even going to set things up in those different areas. They're almost like completely different locations in some cases. Yep. I think when we deploy stadiums, we start with something that's like previous good at another venue. And then we have a few iterations of events where we are tuning things and saying, well, Mm -hmm. Transit power was good, but we need to cut down the data rates. Uh, they're too high. The utilization's still spiking too high, that sort of thing. So it's not like mm -hmm. a deploy to be done. Sometimes you get lucky and you're like, okay, job's done. But other times it's iterative, you know, in, uh, in venues, different materials mm -hmm. that are in suites that weren't in another suite, you know, uh, different, maybe the ceiling's open in one venue, the ceiling's closed in another venue. Uh, just the size of the venue, how, how far, how, how many seats there are makes a big difference uh, in tuning. Yeah, I think the other big problem is, is that, you know, when do you have an opportunity to invite 85,000 of your best friends that all have cell phones, right? And you have a small window, four or five hours to make all that work. Yeah, sure. nothing simulates a human yeah. crowd quite like a human crowd. <laughs> What do you mean? Our planner is perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that attenuation area thing? Yeah, it's just a... Uh... <laughs> it's 100% that. We need. we need to have, well, that like... That brings up... Know. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> right, well, that just comes into the whole planning thing, right? You almost can't plan too much before you actually go out and deploy, because unlike a lot of places, you know, it's, it's difficult to install equipment assuming you can find the right location and you can get enough, enough of the APs in where you need them to be, then you have to, like you were just saying, you have to go with the fact that when you're in there deploying and testing and setting up, there's almost nobody there. So the RF characteristics, how it's going to perform 
you're not really going to know until the first day when everything gets turned on and people walk in. And like you said, now you've got 85 other thousand, thousand people in there with you instead of 10 when you're doing the setup and initial testing. I'm practicing this simultaneously doing PowerPoints while we talk things. So I should actually mute myself because you can probably hear my typing here. Okay, well, any, any other uh, things that are totally uh, different between a stadium and uh, let's say a corporate office or a hospital uh, besides our XSOP and, and those kind of things and, and may, maybe the usefulness of planning is less. Any, anything else that works totally differently on a stadium? Uh, so when you're doing a stadium, uh, there's only like four hours, let's say, for a game that's going on. If something is wrong and you have to troubleshoot it, you only have those four hours because as soon as everybody leaves, then, you know, the problem will go away. You don't know what's going on. So it's pretty critical to very quickly identify what the problem is, if you can, and get people investigating, capture as much data as you can without breaking the system. You know, don't turn debugging on everything when you've got a high load. That's a recipe for exploding. Uh, but to me, that's one of the challenges, like that we don't necessarily, a lot of people don't have the uh, sense of urgency, right? Like this is happening, figure it out now, because in two hours, we don't, we're not, we're going to lose the chance to do this again. We're going to have to wait for another event. Right. So that's mm -hmm. a big, big issue that I see that you don't necessarily see that at a hospital or, you know, uh, corporate because people are there for eight hours. You know, they, lunchtime might be the big time when something bad happens. And you have a, that's like a similar thing. Like you've got this finite time to troubleshoot something. Yeah. You got to wait till next Sunday. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say as well, the traffic profile that you see at these sorts of large events can be unlike anything else as well. What we've been seeing is a trend for, you know, loads of people want to share content immediately. So you see these massive peaks and troughs in utilization where there'll be, you know, the pre-show entertainment or something happens on the pitch, let's say, and everybody's done videoing or taking their pictures and all of the cell phones now have, you know, auto upload to the cloud enabled. They're shooting, you know, high resolution video, high resolution photographs, and it is gigabytes of data leaving in a very, very short amount of time or trying to. Um, and we've, we sort of, you know, coined the, the expression of like a bit of a sink storm is what we term that when we see it because it's just massive upstream utilization. And, and, you know, you see, I think something else uh, for the panel, too, is we talk about the stadium, and a lot of times that revolves around the bowl. You know, something else that's equally, you know, critical is the gates, you know, mm -hmm. trying to move 85,000 people in a matter of two or three hours, making sure the guns work and, you know, making sure that, you know, we're not using, let's say, Uni2 uh, extended channels there where we can be impacted by radar, et cetera. And I was curious, from the panel perspective, um, you, do you guys work on the gates as well? I mean, do you see that as a as a pain point? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for, yeah. If you can't if if you can't get people in the building, that's a problem. And the same goes with the uh, point of sale. I mean, if you can't, um, you know, if you're impacting revenue because the Wi-Fi doesn't work, then you're going to have some serious issues. So that's and, and that's when your phone's going to ring, right? I mean, your phone's ne not necessarily going to ring if somebody can't get a splash page in section five hundred, but you know, if point of sale is down or you can't get people in the building with tickets, your phone's going to be ringing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I've added what Jake and Matt said. said. The, the, the ticketing actually becomes my number one priority. Uh, I make sure that there's not a problem with ticketing. I have individuals at each and every ticketing gate at the beginning of a game. I would never use a channel that could possibly change channels because of some sort of right. DFS event. The other thing is that's the dedicated area. I dedicate access points to ticketing to make sure that there's not an issue. Yeah, we don't share that radio with, with never. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, uh, just so that uh, before we start the webinar, hate to bring this up, but um, so, so that this keeps stays manageable for uh, George and Will to, to moderate and we can see everybody's hands. If, uh, you know, uh, would it be okay if everybody else except uh, those that are listed as, as panelists, so Matt, uh, Jeanette, and Marcus, and, and of course, Will and George, if everybody would shut their videos uh, off, every, everybody else. And, and uh, so Matt can, when Matt talks, for example, the Cisco people can talk on top of him. But, uh, you, you know, when 
at any other time, only Matt can ask uh, the permission to talk for Cisco, if that's okay, if that's fair. Because uh, because that's just your, you know so we get equal uh, opportunities per vendor. I know uh, Jeanette and uh, and Marcus are only only there themselves. Thanks thanks guys. So so that just to you, you know keep this manageable between uh, us and make especially make it easier for Will and George to uh, kind of keep things going. I hope that's okay. And when everybody's uh, when you when you're not talking, please keep yourself muted. I'll try to remember that myself as well. But I'm. I'm known to be horrible at it, but I'll I'll do my best. Okay. Uh, question: Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yes. Another question: Is Stefanik still on the line? I haven't. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, we have like one minute before go time. Any anybody? Any questions, comments, anything? We're good All to good. go. You know, this just, you know, two three thousand people uh, sign up for this, so 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 no pressure, guys. Uh, <laughs> let's let's just you know have fun and, and make it a good one. Uh, we'll be live in for everybody. Well, we're, we're live already, but we're supposed to start. To <laughs> I was gonna say, we're already live. Yeah, we're, we're, we've been live for, <laughs> for a good 15 minutes. And, and there's like, I don't know, uh, more than 300 participants already ahead of time here. So, so you know, what do you guys say? We just kick things off because, you know, um, there, there's some introductory stuff here and then we'll go from there. How about that? Yep, let's do yeah. it. All right, can you see my PowerPoint in full screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so here we go. Uh, just for, for those of you that just joined, uh, thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, today we're gonna talk about um, Echo House Stadium. Uh, well, this is the Echo House Stadium webinar uh, with a, with a uh, you know, focus in high, high density in general. And uh, you know, today we're especially fortunate to have uh, three top experts from the t three top Wi-Fi vendors here from Cisco, Aruba and Ruckus. I'll let uh, the lady and gentlemen introduce themselves in a bit. Uh, also, we have the outmost expert uh, panelists today, uh, George Stefanik and Will Jones, who you know design and deploy the biggest events uh, in the world, the biggest stadiums in the world as well. So, so it's gonna be, I think, a pretty good uh, webinar is an understatement. And uh, without further ado, uh, we are on the dot, so here we go. Uh, we already, just as a backgrounder, before you joined, uh, we already talked about uh, some things that, you know, um, make make a great Wi-Fi network, and uh, we also talk about things that might work at a stadium, but might not work at at home or at your enterprise and stuff like that. There are certain ground rules, and so we started 15 minutes ahead of time uh, just to you, you know do this Brady bunch uh, chatting here. And uh, if you're interested in that, check out the webinar recording later on. So. On that topic, uh, this webinar will be recorded and the recording should be available in a couple of days. All right. Um, at the same time, uh, one other thing about the webinar in general, I wonder if we have uh, Jerry Alla or, or uh, somebody else from the Echo team on the line answering questions. I hope we do. Uh, I haven't heard from them, but uh, but I'm assuming Jerry and or Nick will be answering the questions on the line. And also we will be uh, outside of the chat, uh, which is live. We will be answering some of the main questions at the end as well. All right. Uh, this is the, the mandatory sales slide. I work for Ekahau. I'm using, and um, this is what we do at Eka, how we do this kind of, you know, tools for Wi-Fi design, deployment, and um, and we also do Wi-Fi training to teach you how to do good Wi-Fi, how to use these tools, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming some, some, if not all, of the panelists uh, uh, today use our stuff. And... Um, Okay, so here's the Brady Bunch we have at play today. And um, let's go one by one. Uh, who's this guy? And hey, check out the awesome animation, by the way. 
<laughs> this is some PowerPoint <laughs> magic right here, guys. I spent the entire afternoon with this. Who's this guy? Hello. <laughs> The shortest introduction I have ever seen. <laughs> Quite informative. Uh, I got a lot out of that actually myself. I feel good about it. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm Will from Pylon One. We're a um, specialist company. We deal mostly with um, temporary networks is the bulk of our business, but they are very, very large, high density environments. So, um, you know, people come to us with, yeah, a venue that has got thousands of people arriving at it for a conference or something else and there is no infrastructure we will go and build that infrastructure from the ground up if necessary or we work with a lot of large public venues as consultants to you know, make sure they're delivering uh, what's necessary for these shows and which city are you now just out of curiosity i'm currently in barcelona um people can possibly guess what i'm here for but uh we'll leave it there <laughs> <laughs> all right well, Fair enough. Thank you so much, Will, for joining. And Will, you're also an Ekaho master, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah, I was uh, very, very pleased to be invited to join the, the Ekaho masters at the end of last year in Tenerife for that meeting. And it's uh, an amazing experience. And I think that's where we kind of kick, kicked this idea off as well, uh, to get you and George here as, as expert panelists. Speaking of which, uh, George. Yeah, thanks, Yussi. I'm going to make it quick because uh, I want to make sure we have enough time for, for all the panelists and all the great discussion. But I'm George Stefanik with Active Expert. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, everything under the sun, uh, specializing in healthcare largely, but the enterprise stadium, high density. Uh, very appreciative to be here with uh, Marcus, Matt, and Jeanette. Um, I don't know that we've ever had a panel like this before. Um, so uh, pretty excited to be here. Yeah, thanks so much, George, for coming and this is this is indeed pretty unique to have all the three uh, top vendors uh, on the same webinar it's it's really really uh, some, something else and and george just real quickly uh, thank you for letting us also you know um, letting us beta test uh, our upcoming products at some of your your uh, stadium so thank you so much yeah you're welcome it's a great opportunity uh, for all so thanks cheers man uh, and then who's who's this guy I'm kind of curious where you got that picture from, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Matt Swartz, I'm principal engineer at Cisco, um, been here for about 16, 17 years, and I've been focused on high density Wi-Fi at Cisco since about 2008, so about the last 10, 11 years. And between you and your uh, colleague Josh, sir, you're kind of competing of the worst high speed driver in the world as well. I, 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 uh, I mean, I'm probably more well known for yanking the emergency brake on 60 than he is, but, <laughs> um, but he will put the fear of God in you um, in a rental car. I'm yeah, just don't try that at home. Yeah. <laughs> but I've definitely <laughs> yanked the emergency brake on, on the interstate before and it's not advised at all. Safety tip provided by Matt Schwartz. I'm here I for you. Thanks, Matt. I, I really appreciate you coming, man. And uh, we can, for example, see you, um, Matt, often at um, you and Josh doing, you know, the high density presentations at Cisco Lives and, and stuff like that. I'm assuming you're presenting again at Cisco Live uh, in June. Yep, yep. We'll both be in San Diego. And I should quickly mention, uh, I've got a few folks with me on the call. So we've got uh, Todd Simmons, um, Jake Fussell, and Leslie McCarty as well that will probably chime in at some point. Awesome. Thank, thanks everybody for coming. And you're all with Cisco Advanced Services, is that right? Yep, correct. Uh, well, it's, it's now called customer experience, but uh, same thing. I apologize. Yeah, I use baby <laughs> terminology. Well, I mean, if you ask me next week, it might be different, so you can't fault you too much. Let me advance the slide on my projector. Uh, Marcus. Okay, yeah. we, we can barely see you there on the right hand side corner. Yeah. I do apologize because, uh, you know, I was just incredibly lucky to, uh, you know, just to randomly take a picture of the stadium and I got you all in the same picture. So not everything went perfect, but you know, uh, it is what it is, right? Hey, don't worry about it. It's just like stadiums, right? So Marcus Waymar, I work with Aruba Network, HPE. Uh, I work on the Aruba customer engineering team. Uh, I do a lot of fly and fix of Port, but my background is in high density outdoor complex RF environments. Uh, I've been working on stadiums since about 2010. Um, supported the two Super Bowls that Aruba's been lucky to, enough to participate in and uh, 
I'm really excited to be on this. Like you said, this is interesting to see, you know, the vendors talking and not fighting and <laughs> hopefully everything is smooth and we're happy. <laughs> and and uh, so was the last Super Bowl at the Mercedes-Benz Arena, was that yours or Chuck's or whose was it? So that was, uh, I was there for the Super Bowl. It was kind of a, a joint venture between Chuck, Adam Sowers, myself and uh, Clark Vitek on our team. All right. All right. Thanks so much for joining, uh, Marcus. Much, much appreciate that. And thank you, uh, Chuck Lukaszewski, for pointing uh, me to, to you. So, you no Twitter, Chuck. Uh, then, Jeanette, good evening. Hey. <laughs> good evening and, and morning and everything for everyone else. Yeah, so I'm Jeanette Lee. I work for Ruckus Networks. I run our product solutions and technical marketing team. I'm based out of Sunnyvale. We spend a lot of our time working on the product, testing it, trying to get the best possible performance. We work with engineering, we work with the field. Uh, we talk to pretty much everybody. So this is another chance for me to talk, which I never turned down. Awesome, thanks so much for coming, uh, Jeanette, as well. And uh, you're known uh, for taking humongous risks in your job as well, I understand, because uh, you have a really nice car and you let, let me drive it once. Uh, and given my <laughs> bad reputation with cars, I, I really appreciate that. Well, you anyway, didn't tell me that before I let you drive it. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> these things. So thanks everybody so much for coming. Um, also, if you're not on Twitter, just FYI, um, this, this is what we always need to say, like this is the mandatory Twitter endorsement. If you're not on Twitter, go on Twitter. All the latest and greatest Wi-Fi stuff is there first. And, uh, and you know, you can see who I follow. I only follow pretty much uh, the Wi-Fi geeks out there. So, so go and, um, you know, my first name, last name, super easy to remember. I'm sure you remember it already. Or if you don't, just Google Yussi Wi-Fi. All right. So, on with the show and uh, enough blabbering. So here we go, 24.05 terabytes. What, any thoughts? <laughs> That's a lot of uh, <laughs> pictures and video and everything, yeah. <laughs> so last year, 16.31, so quite a growth. And thank you, Extreme Networks, for this data. Um, so one interesting thing about this, and, and if you Google Extreme 2019 Super Bowl stats, you'll find it. Uh, the, the interesting thing to me was uh, this largest source, 10.8 terabytes, and we touched this briefly uh, before the show, iCloud data. So this is instant upload, right? Uh, when you take a picture and you're connected to Wi-Fi, it instantly uploads. Is, is this that traffic and how how necessary is it really to have that instant upload go, you know, that photo to be instantly uploaded to the cloud? If you're not sharing it anywhere, it's just going there. Isn't this a bit useless? Uh, it's 10 well, I would say that uh, if you don't, the phones are going to automatically do it. And if you don't have the capacity to support the people doing it, it's basically just going to slow down everybody else that's around you trying to do something else like, you know, look at Facebook, look at their Instagram feed, something like that. So, but we live in a world where people go to these event, events and they want other people to know that they're at the event. And so getting their pictures on the internet and having people see that, you know, hey, I'm at the Super Bowl, look at me, it's cool. Um, it's just a, that's the nature of the beast in these venues, so. But, but what, what I'm saying is, yes, you can share those pictures. Matt, I'll let you go in a second. You can share those pictures, but that's a fraction of this, I claim. Most of this is just backup, photos being back up, backed up to the cloud. But I, little do I know. Uh, Matt, your, your turn. Well, I mean, I, I would say that in, in our experience, um, it's very similar to what Marcus is saying, though. There, we, we call these vanity events. So you look at Super Bowls, World Series, any playoff game, anything like that. Um, everybody wants everybody, all their other friends to know that they're there, right? So, so if you look at, um, I remember one of the Super Bowls, uh, I think it was the one in New Orleans. Um, at the time, I mean, every year these, these records get broken, every single year. Um, the, the consumption model is just off the charts. But you figure you have all these people in the French Quarter taking pictures, and then as soon as they hit Wi-Fi, when they're coming into the Superdome, they all start going up, right? So you've got that kind of backlog of, of traffic that's just – uh, a siphon that's just waiting to blow when they when they get onto some data. 
But then, um, then you also have all the things that happen during the game where people are just like, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Now, when you go to like other high density events that maybe aren't so glamorous, you'll see kind of a reverse. You'll see more down than up. But in all these vanity events, it's, it's way more up than down. Got it, got it. So, so just to point out, here's the difference, like 10.8 terabytes iCloud data, but then only three terabytes, only three terabytes of social networking data transferred. I just don't get it. This is vanity, right? Social media. Well, and it's also, I think, just a matter of people don't even realize how much they're consuming, how much bandwidth they're consuming. Most people have no idea what their devices are doing in the background. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I just wish there was a way to kind of, uh, let's say, in a suboptimal Wi-Fi network. Of course, Marcus's network like, like blew it out the park, hit it out the park and, and took all this beating. But, but I mean, in suboptimal Wi-Fi networks, maybe there was a way sometime in the future to, to you know, delay some of these, um, you know, cloud upload things. Hmm. One, one thing, um, I'm going to let Todd jump in here. We had a little side chat going on here, but... I mean, there's another reason why the consumption keeps going up. So I'll, I'll let Todd explain. Or maybe I won't if Todd isn't there. Oh, Todd yeah, took a second to unmute, unmute my audio. Thanks, uh, Matt. With the one thing that, that is really, from what I've seen from the multiple Super Bowls and, and events, MLB events that, that we've seen, is that the, the carriers have really gotten on board. So when you walk into a venue, you don't really have an option to connect to the guest Wi-Fi. Well, actually, you don't have to connect to the Wi-Fi. You know, with AT&T and Verizon being our two biggest uh, carriers in the nation now, they're setting and working with the NFL, the MLB, the NBA, uh, and sponsoring these networks. So when you walk into that venue, your device automatically connects to that particular carrier's network because it takes it off of the DAS, relieves pressure from the DAS, and puts more pressure on the Wi-Fi because there's more bandwidth associated with Wi-Fi. When you walk into a venue, you might have 40 or 60 megahertz wide as far as your DAS goes, but you'll walk in, you have 240 megahertz wide as far as bandwidth that you can associate to the Wi-Fi devices, and that's why the traffic is consistently increasing. Yeah, and, and Kevin Franzen, uh, Will, you're next. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Franzen on the chat said actually, and, and Kevin is uh, one, of, one of the key stadium guys in the world as well. Thanks, Kevin, for joining. He said very well that, uh, you know, social media, when you upload social media stuff, it's compressed. Uh, so, so the picture isn't full quality. But when you do a backup, uh, let's say to Google Cloud, if you have paid, yep. you, you know, if you have so selected uh, your, your, uh, your pictures will go there high resolution or full resolution. <laughs> oh, Jeanette, you're pulling a Halloween trick on us. <laughs> yes, that. the lights in this room have a timer. <laughs> yes, Will, Will Jones. Uh, Kevin actually <laughs> just made the point that I was about to raise that, yeah, a lot of these backup services, iCloud, upload to Dropbox, they're sending the full resolution, uncompressed, you know, the full fat data. If you put a picture on Twitter or Facebook, it's being compressed down to a, a much lower resolution. So, you know, um, I didn't look recently, but I think the, you know, average cell phone these days has quite a high megapixel camera. They take, you know, a photo that's 15, 20 megabytes. When you put that to Twitter, it's, it's kilobytes of data. Um, so yeah, it really is heavily compressed and something else that's come back from the chat, I think was uh, about hotspot two. Um, I think HS two was enabled on the Super Bowl network this year, Marcus. Yes. So Verizon, we had the Verizon as study and that's something that the last Super Bowl had as well. And I, that's definitely a figure that's driving up, uh, take rate, unique clients associating that sort of thing. Uh, we see huge amounts of, you know, cellular customers associating these networks. So that's taking resources, IP addresses. Uh, the other good news with that though, it's actually getting the phones to, to be on the Wi-Fi and not beaconing for their home network and then 15 other networks. So there's less uh, you know, noise in the air for us so we can get higher uh, capacity. So I'm all for the offload, uh, the cellular offload. Hmm. All right. Anything else about the uh, extreme stuff, or should we go to the next posted article regarding the uh, Super Bowl, which is surprisingly from Ookla. Uh, not that we have anything to do with that company, however. Uh, so, just happened to run across this awesomely expert article where, where you, you know, a, a huge 
well-known Wi-Fi expert was uh, was interviewed. Anyway, uh, so, so here's the statistics of uh, mean download and mean upload uh, for Wi-Fi at the game. Marcus, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, would you agree? Is this uh, what you were seeing? Uh, is this yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, during the event, you roam around, you check things out, and I was really excited to go in the bowl during like third quarter with my Note 8 cell phone and pull down 35 meg and upload 45 meg with you know everything that's going on around you uh that's pretty good numbers for a event where you know everybody's pretty much on the network so the the uh the college championship had a higher number of uh mean up and down but maybe uh the college kids had you know a little bit more to to share and upload but definitely Definitely saw this. Is this, uh, what do you think, Jeanette and Matt, uh, is this like typical numbers uh, for, for a huge, huge game? Yeah, I, I mean, depends. I can definitely see that. But yeah, <laughs> now we're going back to it depends again. But yeah, again, they're all going to be designed a little bit differently. But, you know, this kind of speed is almost where you have to be in a lot of cases. We were just talking about the bandwidth, the applications, what people were trying to do. And there was a common wisdom not really that long ago where people were saying, well, for public networks, you don't need that much bandwidth. A couple megs, you're just doing email, web browsing, but it's completely different now. And even the direction, right, mostly downlink versus uplink has changed too. And do you even need, like, 30 megs, that's enough for 4K freaking video. So, so like... It's way more than that. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, you get the people on and off faster, you see. That's the goal yeah. is to not have people sitting there uploading that 5 meg file for a minute. I want them to upload that file in two seconds and then be done so that somebody else can get on and stream their 4K, you know, hey, I'm on the field now, look at me, stuff. Yeah, That's that exactly right. In the chat, actually, the subject of rate limiting in high density environments. Um, just don't do it. It's not worth it. The air will limit yeah. itself when the network gets busy. Yeah. You, you slow down the process mm -hmm. of uploading and you chew up airtime in an inefficient way doing that. So, can you repeat that? No rate limit, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's, for example, Jim Polymer from Denver Airport, which is uh, the first or second, uh, you know, best Wi-Fi uh, network measured by OCLA uh, of, of all of U.S. airports. He, he totally preaches the same message. But you know what? Uh, I'll just be quiet and changing the slides now. I've been consuming too much air time. Will, George, why don't you guys take it over from uh, slides from here on out? I'll just be your deck guy changing the slides. How about that? Sure, sounds good. Will, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, so what makes stadiums so tough? Um, <laughs> I guess the um, we covered this a little bit in the pre pre show chat, but um, the environments are all unique. You know what what we do in one venue is at a high level applicable everywhere. You know you you have a large number of people. There's a a bowl with some seats around it, but structurally these buildings are all very very unique. You know there's massive differences if something's a new build, an old building, the materials used, I mean even country to country, region to region, different construction laws, what you can and can't use for materials, you know, there's a there's a lot and lot of uh, you know variety and that's part of what makes this interesting is you know you, you have some theories about design but then ultimately until you start looking at a venue you don't necessarily know what's going to work exactly in any one setting and you can be very limited in you know mounting options for access points. Some people won't let you put them under the seat. Some people will not let you attach them to the roof. There may not be a roof. Um, yeah, it's it's a physical challenge, I think. Um, yeah, Marcus. I just want to add too, uh, you know, in an office space to hang an AP and a ceiling grid is pretty straightforward. In a venue, a stadium, you might have to core through the concrete. It's going to cost money. It's going to cost tools. So get it right the first time or pay the price. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure true. The stakes are a lot higher 
Yeah, yeah re refitting and doing a second fix is uh, is just often off out of the question. It's you know financially it's completely unviable as well. It may not even be physically possible to go back later to reach some of these areas. So. Yeah, and and I think Marcus kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, especially with existing stadiums, it's expensive. It could be thousands of dollars just to run a cable. You know, you have to X-ray potentially concrete to make sure that you're not drilling through rebar. I mean, it, it's not a uh, an easy proposition. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next slide. Uh, George. All right. So, <laughs> requirements for good stadium Wi-Fi. Who wants to take this one? Don't all raise your hand at once. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take a, a first shot at this here. Uh, we talked about this, and I think the very first thing, or the, at least the thing that everybody should think about before they even get started is plan, right? There's many things you can talk about. There's many tools. There's many knobs you can tweak in many of the vendors. We all have a lot of similar things. We've all got our secret sauce, our special things we do, but there's a lot of commonality here. But again, I mean, it's every venue is different. So that planning becomes so important. And as much as you can do up front, all the better before the people show up. But the other thing is, once they show up, you got a lot of work to do then too with monitoring, making sure things are working because you didn't have all those people there ever before this network came up. And then making sure that you can react when things change, right? Because you have no baseline. When, until people come in there, you've never seen it fully functional, completely loaded. And you're going to have to start creating a baseline. This goes into that post installation piece where you wanna make sure that everything is working and if something suddenly changes and things are acting and behaving very differently than they had before, that you can take action and figure out what happened. Maybe it's something good, but usually it's something bad if something changes all of a sudden that you weren't expecting. So just being able to look for that you can't just deploy this thing, say, hey, it's great. I got 50 meg on game day and then walk away and expect it's just going to stay that way. Right, right. That's a good point. And uh, Matt and Marcus, you both had uh, your hands up. So, Matt, you want to go next? Yeah, um, uh, Todd or one of the other guys say something as well. One of the key things I, w I wanted to say, though, was that, you know, when you go into these uh, large public venues, typically, especially in the brownfield ones, um, you know, you'll find that there's a lot of competing networks. Um, everybody brought their own toys. So, you know, the ticketing right. guys are used to having their own network, the point of sale guys are used to having their own network. Um, and, and you got to do your best to make sure that you get everybody on the same network. So you're not competing with yourself. I mean, you can go through and, and you can dial everything in just perfectly, have the right power, the right data rates, everything. But if you've got a couple of the competing networks out there that are high power, low data rate, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it basically destroys what you have. But, um, I'll let somebody else from our team chime in with some other stuff. And, and this is Todd. So I'll add to that. The other thing, and I'm sure everybody on the panel has fought the same battle that I fight every day, is aesthetics. You, you get the, the, mm. the people that manage the stadium. They don't want to put things where you want to put things. It's not always the, – the aesthetics requirement is not always the, 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 the top of the mind for the architect for a new stadium uh, or the IT director, CIO, CTO for a, an existing stadium – and being able to put the APs where they need to go is, is going to be one of the biggest things. After, after you install them, you can't change their locations very easily. So understanding that where the antenna should be for the best Wi-Fi and then fighting that battle with the aesthetics at the same time. Yeah, that's a great point, Todd. Absolutely great point. Yeah. Marcus. Yeah, so this is awesome. Like, you guys all went and you didn't say what I was going to say. This is, like, going to be really hard to do during, the, during this because everybody – you know, we know these things, right? Uh, the, one of the big things that I see that people forget to do is to scale everything else that touches the Wi-Fi, the DHCP server, the firewall, the switches. Yeah. You know, we, we've deployed Wi-Fi in venues and then run into an issue where the router or the firewall can't handle the number of MAC addresses or the clients that we're feeding it, right? So if you don't scale everything or you don't look at it, you you could have, you know, the Wi-Fi is the other thing that everybody says, like, when something is not working, what is it? It's the Wi-Fi. It's not that the right. DHCP server can't keep up or the leases are exhausted or anything like that, right? It's, uh, it's the Wi-Fi. So being a good Wi-Fi engineer, you need to look at the entire picture and help scale the network to meet the load. If the customer is expecting a Super Bowl-class network, 
then you better have Super Bowl class everything behind the Wi-Fi. So uh, anybody have anything like really surprising non-Wi-Fi that has, you know, impacted the network performance? Not talking DHCP or firewall, but, but something that, you know, you would have never thought of before or that completely threw you off. I'll, um, I can jump in on that one. We're actually currently dealing with some of these issues and yeah, your, your upstream connectivity to the internet, who you buy your transit from, how they are connected to the wider world, that can vary a lot, you know, carrier to carrier as, a, as an ISP. If, every, if, you know, if a large proportion of your traffic is going towards iCloud, let's say, how does your ISP communicate with Apple? Do they have private peering? Are they going across congested transit links? And these things are often, you know, totally out of your control even as a customer you you can't do much about it and it's often very hard to pin down that the issue is you know even further into your isp's network than just the the connection coming to your building you know you can buy a 40 gig 100 gig circuit from somebody and uh, if their upstream connectivity is not very well provisioned it doesn't matter very much marcus marcus as we're tossing real quick uh, matt brought it up but role-based access compress the ssids as much as you can you don't want to have a bunch of SSIDs out there uh, basically chewing up airtime, chewing up your management time. So getting the back of house and sales people and anybody you can to join the same network and then just use role-based access to put them where they need to be in the right VLAN. That's really critical in these venues. Airtime is, is, is precious. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The great feedback on all these. And the one thing you know, I would add, and I think Matt hit it on uh, the nail on the head was there's so many diverse other networks in there, you know, and in some stadiums, you know, the stadium uh, folks may, you know, for example, and I don't want to say, you know, the big organizations, but they use certain channels, right. Um, and trying to stay clear of those channels. And, you know, you may have, you know, different AP groups in certain areas to service very specific needs over the wireless, um, but all great, great responses. Hey, before we move on, um, you know, in, in our Wi-Fi tool land, when we talk about requirements, we talk about like minimum signal strength and, and minimum SNR and, and minimum data rates and, and stuff like that. Like what kind of minimum requirements in terms of something measurable uh, do you set on the Wi-Fi network? And obviously uh, in the bowl, uh, signal strength is probably not going to be an issue and the higher it, higher it is, the better, the closer you can get the APs to the clients, the better. But do you have any baselines on like, uh, let's say outside of the more congested areas, um, you, you know, outside of the bowl and, and, and all that, uh, any minimum signal strength values, any minimum SNR values, anything that, you know, if it goes above or below a certain threshold, you should be on the lookout. So, uh, you know, this is one of those things where past performance or uh, best practice, right? Previously, like five, six years ago, 25 SNR was awesome. Now I'm seeing SNR, we want 30, 35. When you want to get these higher QAM rates, you have to have the high SNR. So really you see SNR is the king for all those things. And when you get a lot of people in an area, in a, in a, in a venue, you'll see your noise floor go up. So don't just look at my RSSI, got to look at the SNR. Yeah, man. And then what kind of differences do you typically see in, in noise floors? Because it, it can be dozens of dB, right, between yeah. game day and empty site. Uh, what, what's 10, the... to 15. 10 to 15 dB from an empty uh, venue to the full venue. And obviously on 2.4, it gets worse. Uh, if you have to support 2.4 in a venue, God help you. But, you know, uh, that, that, no, that there's just that many channels, it gets filled up quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one thing I would add, you mentioned tools you see, you know, when you're in the, the concourse and it's heavy concrete and you start to walk towards the bowl, your tools become alive. I mean, it's just, it's amazing on how they start to interact with the air. And as you start to digress from the, the, the bowl, you can watch the, the, the cool, the tools calm down and cool down. You know, it's uh, the bowl is certainly uh, definitely a, a challenging, challenging area. All right, should we um, move on to the next slide then? Go for it. Done, sir. <laughs> OK. 
cabling factor. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the work I do is temporary in its nature. I, <laughs> we build networks from layer one and upwards. So yeah, cabling. Um, there's often no nice way to do this. You know, it's, it's horrible. You, if you're putting things in under the seats, as well as we mentioned in the, the last section, you often only get one chance at pouring that concrete. If you need to, you know, move an AP slightly up and down a few rows, that's often not possible. Um, the lengths involved in some of these cables, as Marcus mentioned, you know, you have to think about more than just the Wi-Fi here. Stadiums, an 80,000 seat stadium, you will be running, you know, your, your UTP links can often get close to the theoretical maximums. You might have very, very many IDFs and comms rooms, but actually with relatively sparse numbers of things connected back to them. Um, you know, physical cabling containment, making sure it's not going to get trashed, all of these things, they're, uh, they're pretty big challenges. And I think Matt had his hand up there briefly. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of obvious things when it comes to cabling, but some of the things um, that might not be as obvious are uh, we found when you're doing maybe a walkthrough through an existing venue, it's really good to have whoever the local contractor is that knows that venue really well with you because they already know where all the existing pathways are. They know where they can get cables and where they can't get cables. Um, so, so that's one um, because there, there's been a lot of times where there would be engineers go to a venue and just say, yeah, I want to put an AP there, 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 and, and not really um, know that it's like nearly impossible to get a cable to that location. But maybe if they were to pick the, a location 10 feet, you know, to the right, left, wherever, um, you could have served that same area just as well, um, but had a lot easier of a time to, to get cabling there. So I would say for most of our um, stadium walks these days, we normally have the cabling contractor with us. And then we, we make some of our decisions based on where we want it versus where they can get it. Uh, Marcus, go for it. Yeah. The cabling can be a real snag, drag, whatever you want to call it, because uh, especially if you leave the cabling vendor alone to do their job and you say, I want, here's your drawing where the AP is going. And you come back a week later and the AP is like, you know, 15 meters the other way. And he's like, well, I couldn't get it. AP, I couldn't get the cable there. Like, really, you need to talk to us before you just decide where you're going to put that AP because you just completely, you know, impacted my, my coverage. So uh, having uh, an advocate on site during the cabling process that can make those quick snap judgments, the cabling guy says, yeah, that's great. AP, you know, looks great there, but I can't get there. Where else can I put it? Okay, where am I, where, now where am I going to put it? And you got to have somebody that understands RF understands the impact like, oh, that omnidirectional AP now is in the vomitory and it's going to be seen by the entire bolt. Eh, can't do that. Okay, let's move it back here. Yes. I, yeah, I just I'm, wanted I'm to sorry. add one last yeah. thing in there that I forgot to mention is um, we see a ton of cabling problems just in general where you might see an AP flaking out. Uh, maybe it's going offline or something. So being able to run TDR tests from the switch to actually check the length and integrity of the cable is pretty key. Um, and we do a lot of that. So um, a lot of times if you find something funny going on and then you test that cable from the switch, you'll see that there's something wrong. Uh, yeah, we've, we've lost plenty of access points to, you know, water ingress. I mean, um, they pressure wash the seats in these stadiums. It doesn't matter how well you seal those enclosures, you will inevitably have some casualties over the life cycle of a, of a facility, you know. Um, cabling gets damaged, it can be very hard to replace it, uh, you know if possible, maybe put redundant cabling in, you know, multiple cables going in the same direction. It's quite often when I've been working with facilities, it, it costs almost nothing to put two outlets at the same spot as it does to put a single one there. You know, the actual conduit and the running of the cable is the tricky bit there. So yeah, think about spares and uh, yeah, future of uh, future requirements, maybe. Yeah, and I think Marcus and Matt hit the nail on the head again. You know, a lot of times you just can't put the access point where you want it. There's some compromise. And I think a lot of times when you look at the stadium deployments, there's really three optimal locations, right? Well, not, not necessarily optimal, but there's three locations. It's going to be overhead, under the seat, or the rail. If you have an existing uh, stadium, for example, it's very expensive to go under the seat. So then you start looking at other options, you know, maybe the handrail option. And then how do you get the cable there, right? It's usually a little bit easier in some cases to get a cable to the handrail than it is under the seat and drilling concrete. Uh, Marcus. Marcus. Yeah, I heard a comment from some one of our partners recently about a, a cascade of compromise. 
is a term that I'm like, you will get a cascade of compromise in these venues and you need to stop it as close to the beginning of that compromise as possible. Otherwise you're going to not have the performance you want. Exactly. Uh, Jeanette. Yeah. Yeah. I just exactly what everyone's saying, because this kind of goes back. It seems like there's a theme, which is true, right? That they're all different and what you're going to choose or what's going to work is so different, but you know, going that, the difference between the overhead, behind the seat, under the seat, handrail, um, they all can play into this, but I think you also have to keep in mind that you're going to get uh, different levels of coverage with all those two, and that's something to think about. I mean, it may be there's more work to get the cabling under the seat, for example, versus handrail, but if you need the coverage and you don't have any other option, that's what you're going to have to do. And a lot of this can be just educating these venue owners that this is the requirement that they're going to have to deal with. Yeah, we, we often say to people is, you know, there's, there's compromises that can be made in the design and the placement, but ultimately if you want it to work, <laughs> there's, there's only so much we can do. After that, it's just, you know, every change we make, every compromise, it compounds the performance of the network and sooner or later you end up with something that isn't going to deliver what people, you know, expect or what's even cap you know, the equipment's capable of. Wow, I think this is going to be a highly uh, discussed topic here. <laughs> Coverage design and methodologies. And I think, you know, I think it comes down to recipes, right? Everybody has a recipe for cheesecake. On the end of the day, it's good cheesecake. Uh, but everybody has a different way to get there. So who wants to go first? I'll go first. All right, Marcus. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was looking at this, one of the bullet points you guys sent us, right? Uh, I just was going through like the history of where we placed APs and how we've continuously kind of gotten better and better. Uh, and coverage is not the term I would use. I would say capacity, like having a coverage design versus a capacity design, that's something else. But uh, you've got under, uh, under seat, obviously, the Pico cell deployment is what we really like. Uh, it gets the AP as close to, to the people as possible. It also uses bodies to attenuate AP to AP interaction. So that's what we like. Handrail mount is also very popular you get access to uh, something that you know is very close to the people as well and sometimes it's easier to core through where the handrail is to uh, to get the devices in there um, and then in a, in a venue I'm gonna use them all guys sorry but in an overhead you know uh, basketball NHL type arena firing down from above from the catwalk is a great uh, strategy because basically that gets you nearly perfect line of sight to everybody's device. That's one of the issues in these is, you know, if I'm coming from somewhere with a directional antenna, I need to get to the device without going through 14 people's shoulders. You know, if I'm trying to come from behind, it's really not ideal. Coming from above and facing out and away really gets you the isolation from each AP and also great uh, SNR, great, you know, signal because there's basically nothing between the device and the antenna. Yeah, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of the same things. I, I would say that from Cisco's, or at least from our design methodology with our teams, you know, all, all, everything that Marcus said is is a tool in the toolbox, and, and I think we all carry similar toolboxes. But um, I think some people have uh, different different tools that they reach for first. So for us, I still believe in good antenna technology. Um, and I think that everyone, including us, um, have room to improve there. So I think that we can make better antennas. And, um, and we said we weren't going to talk about uh, future stuff. So let's just say that we're, we're always trying to make better antennas. So um, our high density antennas, you know, in the beginning, back in like 2008, when we were looking at Yankee Stadium, we had nothing good for that stadium. I mean, in the very beginning, no, nobody had really done this. And, and it was showed, right? And then after that, we came out with a, a stadium kind of specific antenna and then another one and then another one. Um, and even still, I still think we can get better there. That being said, you know, you got to get closer to the clients. So that's when we started doing the handrails. Um, so we started getting down in the handrails. We started putting things on the front. Um, and I'm kind of going in order of how we do it. Like if, th if there's a good overhang, I, I, me personally, I have a hard time wanting to put an AP under a seat if I have an overhang that's, you know, 20 feet above a seat. Like, it just doesn't, um, I, I, I don't really, 
uh, um, calculate that very well because it's so expensive and there's so many other things to deal with. But, um, but that being said, will we put APs under seats? Sure. Uh, if I get to the point where I can't get to it with, with a overhang, I can't get to it very well with a handrail and I can't get to it very well from the front, I'll absolutely put it under the seat. So that's kind of a, our stance on that. I'll just jump well, in as well there. And yeah, good, good antenna selection as well. Um, there's so many people out there making really great antennas these days, not just the vendors, there's third party options. You know, if you can't find an exact pattern that you will achieve your coverage requirements from the vendor, there's, you know, uh, a Celtex, Ventev, Tesco, all, all these places you can go to, they've all got all sorts of, you know, patterns and some of them are quite unique as well. You know, they're not just the, the typical, you know, 30 by 30, 60 by 60 or whatever. So yeah, don't, um, don't be afraid to consider things that are, you know, third party. I mean, I, I think all the handrail antennas are third party ones. I don't think any of the vendors make their own there. So, you know, there's there's loads of stuff out there. And um, again, this is something I think it was actually at Echo Masters. You see, Jim Palmer said when they were designing the um, RF for Denver Airport, they were very limited in where they were physically able to place access points. So they would place them in Echo and then just swap the antennas around to simulate the, you know, approximate coverage they could get with different types of antennas until they found something that looked, you know, acceptable and then went and actually mounted it and surveyed it for real. So. Yeah, and, and to Matt's point, I'll just add, you know, you spend so much money for the access point, the cable, the switch port, the drilling, the running of the cable and all that, and then you fail at the antenna, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the whole package, especially when you start to radiate that signal, right? Antenna selection is critical. I got I to gotta jump I, in again, sorry. <laughs> so, so like at, at first, I mean, We'll be very careful here. I think I think everyone agrees. Like we're not we're definitely not here to um, throw any shade towards any any vendors um, ourselves or anyone else. But I would I would make a general statement that um, in terms of antenna selection, make sure you really understand that antenna. Uh, what I'm getting at is like anyone anyone can go and look at a data sheet, um, and is that antenna doing exactly what that data sheet says it's doing? Um, there's been plenty of times where we've been pulled into to cap cases for Cisco networks that had, you know, non Cisco antennas. Uh, and then we go in there and we're trying to figure out why this network is, is performing so horribly. And then we take a couple of those antennas, we send them to our, our labs, we put them through the chamber and then we find out craziness like, Hey, did you know that there's eight dB of loss on the cable? Did you know that, you know, it's not the beam width that you thought it was. It's actually looks more like an Omni than a directional antenna. I mean, things like that. So um, as I was listening, I was just sitting there thinking about all the antenna troubles we've had. And uh, just, I, I would make just a generic statement saying, make sure you really understand the antenna you're deploying. Uh, yeah, I'd, I would agree totally as well. It a quality antenna is a quality antenna. You can buy cheap, nasty things and you can buy things that look like they should be good, but yeah, do validate what you're, uh, what you're using there. Marcus. Yep. Uh, Jeanette, you're going to get a turn, right? <laughs> I just want to say two <laughs> things real quick. As far as antennas go, uh, side lobes, you know, having a very tight beam is great, especially when you get high directional, you know, 14 DBI, but you really have to watch these side, look at the antenna pattern, and if you see like a side lobe sticking out over here, that's going to make a mess of your high density design in these venues, because now that AP is not just covering the, you know, two seating section, whatever. It's also light lighting up this other seating section over here. And that's what we've seen with other, you know, third party antennas. These, the second thing with antennas is what I'm seeing now is a lot of antenna manufacturers that don't make dual pole antennas. And with MIMO APs and clients now, not having a dual pole antenna is basically like cutting your performance in half for your, your access point. You know, you want to have a high capacity network, don't deploy a, you know, vertical only antenna when your AP does, uh, you know, MIMO. Yeah. Yeah. Jeanette, did you want to have yeah. something? Oh, I think everyone's covered it, all this so well, but you know, I can probably just echo on a lot of that is right. It's figuring all that out and deciding. Yeah don't skimp on things like the antenna very clearly and, and making sure you have that and having that knowledge up front too, just because if you're going to be using some kind of modeling software, you know, that has to be accurate too. Getting all that in there. Yeah. It's, it's key because the RF is the king in all this. All right, guys.
George Will. What's what's next and your thoughts first and then uh, then the panelists? Wow, coverage design tools. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think Marcus kind of hit on that earlier. Coverage versus capacity, right? Um, they're two very different animals. Um, and it's multiple tools in the toolbox, kind of like what Matt mentioned. You know, it's just not one tool. I mean, you're going to be using spectrum analyzers. You're going to be doing uh, predictive potentially. You're going to be doing any perhaps, you know, validation surveys. You may even be doing some AP on a stick to, to validate those antennas. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox that, that go into designing. And I think also it's more than just the front end. You know, Marcus alluded to it earlier with DNS and DHCP, you know, having the tools on the back end because you may be trying to hit some websites, the pipe may be saturated and, you know, you get that knee jerk reaction. It's the wireless and you, you're focusing on something that, you know, likely it may not be the problem. So, but I'd love to see other folks answers on this. I feel like this was the quickest slide you see. You just said, I got out, I kicked, done. Next slide. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I think that's what you wanted me to say. <laughs> You'll get your uh, Ekaha hoodie later, okay? And the $20, I promised you. Right, yeah. So design <laughs> tool, I mean, uh, designing it, the network, uh, you got to have the right tools for the right job. And the, the Akaha, uh tool that we use is great. I mean, you have pretty much all the vendors' APs, all of the antennas. So it comes in really handy to say, I want. what if we put the AP here? Oh, what happens now? Okay, let's try to move it over here. Um, validation tools, I guess, come into this too. But we like, you know, you got to test with the device that people are carrying around in the venue too. Uh, don't do a validation with a laptop and say, I got next 65 everywhere. I'm great. You know, that next 65 is really next 70, 75 with a handheld device. So. You see, I see what you're typing. <laughs> <laughs> We're all watching you. Oh, so, sorry about that. Next, next slide. No, no, I, I, am, I, I will say though that, um, that we do use Echohal as I think everyone does, but I mean, we specifically, we, we didn't always do that. And the reason that we changed was, was What's me related to um, working with UC actually now. Um, but um, some of the other tools just weren't working for us. You know, like the, the file sizes were becoming so, so ridiculously large. You couldn't even work with them. Um, so then once we started to figure out that, that Echo was doing things much better, um, there was a couple things, you know, that we specifically wanted, and I'm sure others have, have done very similar things to get um, features and, and requests that they want in there. And they responded very well to that. So um, I think we've been using them ever since and haven't looked back. Uh, Jeanette. Yeah, I just want to put in a little plug also for you guys, but also to just kind of emphasize here, you know, there are a lot of tools out there that have really valuable information, but the other thing that to keep in mind is the best tool isn't going to help someone who doesn't understand how to interpret the information that it's presenting. So just having the best tool isn't going to guarantee that things work. You have to make sure that the engineers who are doing the design or doing the validation actually understand what the tool is trying to tell them. And that just goes back to training, which seems obvious, but I feel like I need to mention it. So Jeanette, um, there's this coffee mug that a guy at Cisco has that I think you would appreciate. We were on a video conference the other day and in the middle of the call, he picks up his mug and he takes a sip and I could read the mug and it said, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. <laughs> yes, I love it. You've got two thumbs up from me. That's crazy. Yeah, I want that mug myself. I, there's a bunch of calls yeah. that that call. It, that was mug. that on the bottom of the mug, Matt? <laughs> no, it's right on the front, but he took a better. nice little pull. <laughs> Kobayashi, right? <laughs> All right. Um, and, and th thanks guys for that. Um, just real quickly on the like weighing of the different methodologies when you're using the tool, like tools like predictive versus AP on a stick. Uh, what, what do you like to do? Let's say you get a, get a uh, you know, an existing stadium uh, that's already built. Uh, do you go hev heavier on AP on a stick or pure predictive in the, in the design of the, uh, 
of the thing or do you rely on both equally how, how does it all all pan out where do you start i think it's if you have the tough. time if you have the time to do a, a ap on a stick i mean that's you can't get more real than that uh, but a lot of times you're doing it quickly the predictive is you know at least if you know what the materials are of the building but especially it becomes real difficult you see when it's a stadium that's not built and it's paper right now and you say okay how, mm -hmm. how what am i going to do so a lot of times we design to a stadium like that but we still try to run in and do a quick validation before things get too far to say one ap every suite is what we said but these suites have concrete between them and there's metal artwork from floor to ceilings so we're probably going to have to go an ap every suite and uh hopefully that's something you can catch with the designers though well before but Yeah, and yeah, just massive difference between, you know, pre-existing stadium versus new one. And there's pros and cons to both. Okay, you cannot measure uh, the the new new stadium that's about to be built, but then again, you can affect the cabling in the best case, right? Uh, did we already talk enough about the antenna types for the design? Uh, should we just we should probably just move forward because we don't have too much time? Uh, so uh, Matt did have his hand up there briefly, so. Uh, all I was going to say was um, on the survey side, um, we tend to not do a whole lot with prediction unless, uh, to UC's point, it, it, it's a building that's not there yet and we maybe want to lay some groundwork, then we would go in and validate later. But for most of the survey work that we do in existing stadiums, we obviously don't go and, and survey from top to bottom. I mean, we've got a, a team of guys that have been doing this for many, many years. What we do do is we go in and we survey all the unique areas. So if there's a section that's a certain size, well, guess what? There's 50 other sections that size. We're not surveying all 50. We're, we're surveying one, and then we know that the other 49 are, are, are yeah, like that. Cookie for like weeks and clubs and stuff like that. Yeah, I think as well, when, once you've done this, like you say, you've got a team of guys who've been doing this for a number of years, you, you get a bit of a feel for how things are going to play out as well. You know, if I put this antenna at this height, at this angle, it's going to yep. roughly do this. And yeah, you, you cannot see RF. I'm not suggesting. A lot of like laser pointers and distances. Yeah. We know we know our distances very well. I mean, they don't, you know, the same antenna, mm -hmm. the same power mounted in the same way. It's going to be the same. Yes, yeah. I think um, Keith Parsons actually has a paper cutout you can get where you can make a like a funnel basically that you look through and it effectively gives you the viewport of a you know a certain mm. antenna beam width. So if you're up in a catwalk, you can basically just stare through this thing and it will give you a rough you know cut off and say, well, hey, if I aim it at this block of seats here, this is what I should be covering, give or take. You know, the, oh, oh nothing's oh, exactly the reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an augmented reality planning tool. <laughs> yeah, RF goggles. I I would uh, kill for a set of those at times, but um, yeah, you know. And I think this comes back a bit as well as like knowing the antennas and the equipment that you use. You know, every, every vendor has different, uh, you know, models of antenna, different access points. When you combine them, you've, you've got a, a different beast again potentially. So being familiar with what you're, you're choosing, you know, I kind of have my weapons of choice. There are certain antenna and AP combinations that, you know, I just have loaded up in Echo as a, like, okay, I want to see what that might look like in a predictive model. Then great. That's limits the choice a little bit, but. All right. Next slide, George, you're still with us or you took the red beast already for a ride. <laughs> Stefanik, you are on mute. Must have taken the beast. Nothing wrong with that. Will, you want to take this? Yeah, challenges with frequency. So RF is a shared medium. It's shared with all sorts of things, you know, not just Wi-Fi, but predominantly the aim of any high density network is channel reuse and making the most use of the spectrum we have. It is a finite resource like airtime. You know, there's so many channels available and each channel has capacity. Your network is basically going to perform as well as, as your RF design does there. Um, I think George might be back with us now. So. Yeah, I, and I'm only going to chime in because I'd love to hear Matt and Marcus and Jeanette. Um, you know, two big things that I always look at, high RSSI, overcome the noise floor, higher qualm, and then channel frequency, uh, which is the reuse, right? Channel reuse. 
Um, and then all that falls under the antennas. So the biggest challenges, of course, uh, that I see, and it was mentioned by Todd, you know, when you start to look at the, uh, the ticketing areas, you do want to make sure that you're not having any interruptions. So make sure that there's no di dynamic channels being uh, changed or selected during ticketing time, for example. And then obviously 2.4 in a bowl doesn't work. We've seen it, we've turned it off, we've watched the, uh, uh, the connectivity and the quality of connection just rise when you turn that off. And obviously adding additional channels, you need to, you need to extend it. Keeping 20 megahertz in the bowl, um, 40 isn't needed, uh, but, uh, but that's what I have to say. I'd love to hear what uh, Matt, Marcus, and Jeanette have to say. Yeah, I mean, DFS channels, to use them or don't use them, we propose to use them in venues like this because you're making a compromise, yes, on when an AP, when a channel hits a radar detect, it might take you know three to five minutes to come back up. On another channel, it's DFS. However, you have so many more APs in the venue that are benefiting from not having channel overlap and stepping on each other that the, the, the airtime uh, benefit is definitely there. Uh, the other thing in these venues, too, is like, um, in a hospital, for example, you basically design the network so that it functions 100% for 100% of the clients. In these venues, we want it to function at a very high performance for like 95 to as many. Obviously, we want to get 100%, but we make some changes that we will say, like, we're not having 802.11b protection anymore. Don't walk in here with an iPhone 2 or 1, you know, 3, whatever is B on, I can't remember. But, like, we want high performance you have to make some compromises in, in uh, supportability turning off 2.4 is great I wish we could do it everywhere some places we can't but definitely definitely do not put 2.4 don't put your production or any kind of mission critical networks on 2.4 gigahertz in these venues and what about uh, ARM RRM all that stuff at a stadium we like to have the, the transmit powers be fixed because now we have uh, a known overlap of APs, in, especially in a very high density area. We, we tune it to have a specific transmit power. RM, ARM, all those things were built primarily to also function as a backup service in case you lost an AP, the AP next to it can power up. We don't, you know, we want APs to basically be at a certain level. So when I walk somewhere, I expect to see this signal. That's what's going to be there. And what about, uh, tra uh, that's transmit powers. What about uh, channels fixed every time? So, yeah, so what we do with Aruba's technology is we basically split up the, uh, we fix the 2.4 AP uh, frequencies. We plan it 1, 6, 11 around. And then we give each one of those APs a specific number of 5 gigahertz channels that they're allowed to choose. We let the system bake for two or three hours, and then we we lock the channels so they won't change during an event. I think Jeanette's got her hand up there. So. Yeah, so I wanted to go back to that one comment about 2.4 gigahertz in the bowl or elsewhere in the venue. And one thing that we've seen, and I won't say this is 100% true, because again, let's throw out the it depends, because I think it's been 10 minutes since any of us have said that. So let's say that again. But one of the things we've seen is that it really will depend also on what you're doing, right? So if you're doing overhead or behind uh, with an AP mounted and then transmitting towards the users, yeah, 2.4 is probably not going to be the best thing or the best choice. Obviously, you're doing both. But there is a difference if you're doing something like underneath the chair. Uh, one thing that we've seen is that 2.4 uh, bodies are much better at absorbing 2.4 than 5 gigahertz, so there is that that you need to keep in mind. You will get some different characteristics and different things, options you can do with 2.4 versus 5 gigahertz, depending on whether you're doing overhead, behind, handrail, or under the seat. So I think that's something that people should think about. I wouldn't just say blank statement 2.4 will never work because um, you can make it work. And anything that gets you more capacity is a good thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in very quickly on that thing as well. Um, I work all over the world, as George does as well, and I, I work in very different regulatory domains. So not everywhere is equal. Um, if you work in some parts of the Far East, you don't have the luxury of 26 channels of 5 gigahertz to play with. You might in, I think the most extreme environment I've worked in is in Indonesia, you get four channels of Uni3. So if I can get a bit of capacity out of, you know, <laughs> three channels of 2.4 coverage in a, in a venue, that's 
better than nothing in some cases, you know. Um, yeah. uh, Matt, go on. One thing I haven't already kind of spoken about. Um, so we do use RM, but we don't let it run uh, wild. So we, we basically cap, um, you know, min and max power, things like that. But one thing that um, you got to be super aware of is, and, and I think that a lot of people know this, but maybe not everybody, is that across the five gigahertz bands, there, there's different um, max TX powers, right? So we've seen plenty of times where somebody will go through and say, uh, power level one across all these, not realizing that some of those channels are six dB hotter than, than other channels. And then you're wondering why, you know, this one AP has 150 clients on it and the ones next to it don't have any, um, because it's basically acting like a, like a magnet, right? The, the client is very, can they go to the hottest one it sees? So, uh, and it'll hold on to that thing forever. So that was um, one thing we wanted to point out is that, you know, beware of the differences across five gigahertz and, and how to balance that effectively. As for DFS, uh, what we do there is, uh, I'm with Marcus. I mean, I, I try to keep as many, as many channels in play as possible. But what we do do is we, we keep a close eye on the number of hits. So if I see that a particular channel is taking a ton of hits, if it's, if it's enough, we're just going to pull that channel out. It's not even, you know, worth using. Now, if, if there's a DFS channel that's taking, you know, one, two hits a day, I, I'm leaving that thing in. You know, like, yeah. I'd rather have that channel. Absolutely. Ooh. I'd rather suffer the slight yep. disruption and inconvenience. And, you know, uh, I think that's a good thing as well, like reining in RRM. You know, the controllers out of the box, the settings in them, they oh, are. Yeah. They, they were never, they never thought of with uh, design. Yeah. stadium in mind. Yeah, you know, RRM can work. I think it can help as well in easing the burden of configuration. But yeah, definitely understand how your vendor's RRM algorithm works. You know, if you can design with how it's going to behave in mind, I think you can get pretty reasonable results from all of these these systems. You know, I mean, we we take both approaches. You know, some places I work in, we do a completely static configuration because we've got the luxury of, you know, time maybe as well. And it delivers very good results, but I've equally had good results from you know, fully automated or semi-automatic, like Marcus was saying, you know, where you're, you're driving the AP groups with certain channel restrictions, uh, RF grouping in Cisco, and so on and so forth. So house channels too, is something maybe we should talk about, uh, like dedicating a channel that you don't use anywhere in the venue to give to uh, someone that comes in that needs to do Wi-Fi, let's say they're even paying to have the Wi-Fi. Uh, for the longest time, we've used like channel 144 because it has to be an AC device. And hopefully, you know, the people that, if they don't bring in something that's uh, AC, sorry, that's your channel. That's what you get. But um, I would, I'm interested to see if anybody else has a strategy like that. What, they, what do they do when people come in and uh, that, you know, they have, to have Wi-Fi and you're like, well, it's going to be pretty tough to use any of these channels when we're here. Do you carve, give them a channel? Do you dedicate the channel all the time? I, I can jump in. I'll say there's a couple. Um, I mean, I guess it <laughs> coming up with the, it depends again. I mean, it, you know, if they're in a, in a certain area and, and like, I think that there's capacity to let them share radios and channels with, with our existing, then we would certainly rather do that than, than not have that channel. Uh, but there's definitely times where we do do what you say and say, uh, okay, like Cisco Live is a, is a prime example. Uh, in the world of solutions, got tons of vendors in there and there's times where we say, okay, this set of channels we're not gonna touch and we're gonna assign them out to, to different vendors and um, they can, put each other in a headlock if they want, but we're just not going to use those channels and let people um, use them. And they try to, you know, they try to allocate them in a way that, you know, these guys aren't stepping right on top of each other. And then one last thing on this point, we have done some, uh, some overlay type things where there's been some, you know, public venues where point of sale, right? Point of sale, super lightweight transactions, not a lot of, not bandwidth intensive. We've taken like a single channel before and reused it all in, in every vending area and it works. And then that way I don't have to worry about, um, you know, them having a good experience. Plus I can keep all these other channels for what I need to do. Yeah. Ticketing is one example too. It's low bandwidth, but it's something that it has to work. Right. So yeah. one channel for ticketing yeah. throughout the whole venue will, will work. We'll get you done. 
Yeah, I was going to say as well that in a convention center where I am this week, you know, the, the channel plan has actually got holes kind of pre-punched into it with the idea being that, you know, they can be assigned to people bringing in their own equipment. So there's some coordination between the, the house system and the, the people bringing their own, own infrastructure in, you know, to try and mitigate us stepping on them, then stepping on us sort of things. And there's no perfect solution, but it, I think, it, you know, if it's coordinated, it can work reasonably well as long as people play by the rules. And, uh, you know, if you assign somebody a channel, they actually use the one you give them, not just, uh, you know. <laughs> follow up. Follow yeah. up and make sure, yeah. Like during the Super Bowls, a lot of our team is just running around with a device like, okay, we said yeah. channel 144, you're on channel 165. Chasing rogues all day long. Please, please change. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, a big bit of that as well is if you're going to have a policy and, you know, you need to try and actually enforce it and police it or else it's a little bit pointless, you know. Um, I think Jeanette was going to say something there as well. Sorry. Oh, oh no, sorry. I was just uh, no, that's okay. don't, around don't here. Be but... Don't use Guys, <laughs> Just real quickly, uh, we have minus seven minutes left. So, so uh, let's briefly do the, re do the rest of the bullets. And... Uh, and, and we'll go, we do appreciate you going over. And if you've got to go, you know, we totally understand you've got to go. But uh, just, just a few things left if we can briefly go through this. Uh, first one being like, same thing, challenges with frequency. But when it comes to non-Wi-Fi uh, things that are, you, you know, fighting for the same airtime with, with your guys' you know, core Wi-Fi network. What, what do you guys see and... Uh, and uh, uh, any any surprising or super high duty cycle things to look out for, Marcus? Why? Well, in the, in the very beginnings of high density, we saw DAS antennas that were basically transmitting at like four watts, and they weren't on our frequency. But the way you know uh, transmissions work is the harmonic was enough to basically wipe out any of the Wi-Fi that was in our area. So uh, that's something we don't see it that much. Now I'm getting, we're starting to pay closer attention to uh, 5G LAA because they're going to start using five gigahertz. Uh, actually, you know, our, what we consider our five gigahertz, it's really anybody can use it, right? It's, it's unlicensed, but that's going to be a big changer, game change, I guess, because the other thing they're doing is guess what? They're putting those APs in under the seats or I'm sorry, they're putting their antennas under the seats the same way that we, you know, have put our APs. So, there's going to be a lot of uh, contention there, uh, no pun intended, right, between LAA and, and, and our system. And as Wi-Fi people, we have to pay attention to that. We have to be cognizant of it and be asking those questions when we're designing networks, like where's the, where is the DAS going? Where, where, you know, what frequencies are they going to be using? Okay, what transmit power, that sort of thing. Um, I don't think... We have, we have a couple venues that have DAS under seat, you know, they're two rows away from our AP, so we don't really see them as an issue, but I think obviously when they start using our frequencies, it's not Wi-Fi, but it's, it's going to be impactful. And on top of that, you have, it's, it's an unlicensed band. So sometimes you don't have a choice that uh, on the other side of that wall is the break room and there's 15 microwaves that are going off, you know, back when we two, four was a big deal. That would be the end of the day, but you know, getting people to say, okay, well maybe not try to use two, four for your scanners in this room. It's going to have to be five gig, that sort of thing. Yeah. I think, um, non Wi-Fi stuff, we see, um, a certain amount of sort of, uh, video and AV equipment, wireless cameras, wireless video senders, and this stuff can often be a little bit tricky to track down because if you're looking for it on a spec and it's, it's an OFDM modulated signal. It looks like a, it's a hundred percent duty cycle. It's a jammer as far as I'm concerned, but, um, yeah, we're, we're encountering quite a lot of that stuff and it's, uh, it's pretty horrible you know we we often if we find them we can try and either you know say to people oh look can you move to this block of channels if the equipment's configurable at all and that's the other thing is we we find some things that there's just no control over it um and there's a there's a product from a company called teradec which is a wireless video sending device and it frequency hops in a 40 megahertz block and the second it sees something else on the channel it hops onto another one and you know if you've got um <laughs> rrm running it, it can drive it mad in some respects because it suddenly just sees a channel you know absolutely slammed and might try and move stuff around so yeah, the, these things are becoming a bit more commonplace, but, um, you know, we, we normally try and police them as well and just sort of say, you know, 
you can run a cable please or use a, a licensed band you know a lot of these cameras they have other options we, we don't that's kind of where we have to go with people all right uh, configuration best practices we already talked about uh, tx power we already talked about channels statics versus dynamic uh data rates um what other like is there any general good practice minimum data rates at stadiums 24 uh minimum data rate or what what, what do you guys use and any other uh configuration best practices that that you know every high density designer should should adhere to It depends. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, uh, five gigahertz, we want clients to be on five gigahertz as much as possible. So we try to bias the transmit power on five gig. It also, you know, two, four radiates farther. So 60 B minimum difference between five gigs. So five gig being 60 B hotter, transmitting higher. Um, I've already mentioned not using 2.4 for uh, mission critical applications because it can get spotty when you've got a lot of people in density. So uh, make sure that that mission critical SSID isn't broadcasting on both bands because the client might see, a lot of clients make their decisions based on RSSI, not SSNR. So they'll see the AP on five gig at night 59 and, and 64 at five gigahertz and they'll connect to that 2.4 and then now they have no capacity, no throughput. Yeah, I think that's uh, when, when we were do, building the capacity calculator and, and looking at these things and looking at the source codes of different clients and how they behave and stuff like that, that's, that's the most undervalued uh, optimization that one can do. And, and like one of the absolute most significant things is, is putting up the 5 gig TX power significantly higher than 2.4, not just necessarily 6 dB, but even more, uh, even more than that. Yeah, 6 dB minimum. I like 9. You know, yeah. it all depends. You yeah, can get we, too low and 2.4 is totally unusable, but. Yeah, I was going to say as well is like not, not using more power than you need for transmit, but also being mindful that you need to maintain a good SNR to the client to, you know, <laughs> achieve a good data rate over the air. Um, Come on, Will. You got practice. to remember, I'd rather yeah. have co-channel than no channel. Co-channel than no channel. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Cutting down the number of SSIDs in the air, um, you know, I think I, most documents from the vendors sort of say try and keep it to four to six in the air. We, we go even lower than that as far as I'm concerned. There should be a public network and then a 1x network for everything else. And if people are bringing stuff in that's, you know, not for public use on the network, corporate devices, and they can't support 1x, you need to go and get a different device. You know, it's... Um, it shouldn't be difficult these days to, to do that, but then I'm pretty sure I've seen plenty of uh, barcode scanners and things like that that just don't support modern standards of wireless. So. All right, uh, just so that so that we get out get out of here at some point. Uh, or Will or George, you guys want to take this? George, huh, are you still there, man? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Wow, game day surprises. Uh, you know. I think Todd mentioned it. One of the biggest things that I look for is the gates, making sure the gates work. You know, you could, you could easily be on the news real quick when the gates don't work. Right. So uh, you want to make sure they're working. Um, and then obviously start to roll into the POS systems, making sure they're operational. Um, a lot of times we'll do rounding, right. Um, they have direct numbers to our team. So if they're having issues, we're able to, to go in and identify, um, know who the vendors are, know who the point people are on the technical side. A lot of times they bring in really crappy devices and they want to blame the Wi-Fi. It's a knee-jerk reaction. You know, the, the gun's not scanning. Well, you know, it's, it's actually rebooting, right? Or, you know, it's, it's having some kind of problem. Um, and a lot of the folks there, especially on the gates, you know, they're, they're there temporarily. They're, they're there just for a few hours and uh, they show up a couple of hours a week for different events. They, they, they're not experts in the, in the handhelds. Um, some other game day surprises, I think, uh, uh, you know, when you have issues, one of the things that I've looked at um, you go to an area and within a few minutes, you can determine if it's channel utilization. When you see a beacon that comes out one every 15 seconds, and now all of a sudden the devices take over, right? Because now they're roaming for their home networks. So they're even taking up more airtime. Um, obviously, that was really to channel capacity. Um, but it's just no, to know where to look um, and also know that the issues are going to be pretty common. It's usually going to be uh, channel isolation and reuse in many cases. That's what I found. 
but uh, I'd love to hear what everybody else had to say. Um, I'll just jump in about very quickly, knowing the vendors you're working with, you know, we're building a network here to provide services to people in the venue, not just the public, but, you know, vendors, point of sales people, the ticketing companies, you know, understand how their system works on the back end as well. Do they have on-site servers? Are they reliant on your internet connectivity? You know, as we said earlier in the presentation, there's more to this than just the Wi-Fi and the RF, you know, where else do they have dependencies on your network to be able to, you know, do their job ultimately? Um, uh, Jeanette, I think. Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's lots of devices and they're all using the network. And in some sense, they all have equal access to the network. But like what was said, they're not equal, right? Uh, for example, you want to make sure press has access and can do everything they need to do. Talking about making sure gates work or everybody knows what well, they're going to know because the press is there and they're talking to everybody. They're on the network. They're trying to do things. So looking at all that and making sure those guys can connect is extremely important too. I think my favorite game day surprises are things like pyrotechnics that are using uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> channels, and cool stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and you really don't I think, that I stuff. I think my other favorite game day surprise was being on the catwalk when the fireworks started at one of the Super Bowls. That was fun too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you know, one thing that I've run into is like, we've had 15 events here and no problems. And then on the 16th event, the press SSID, the DHCP scope basically gets exhausted. And so now the press are the people that you don't want to upset or you want them to have a great experience. Because don't write about you. They're multiply. They're, they're like, yeah, exactly. They're going to force multiply exactly. how good your or bad your network is. So that was like a, oh crap, really quickly, you know, that scope needs to be increased and uh mm -hmm. do that but uh you know security changes too like oh uh president bush is going to be here surprise we didn't tell anybody that but he's going to be here so you can't bring in your mm -hmm. bag you can't bring in this you can't do this it's like okay well this is going to be very exciting very interesting to uh to support this event All right, and, and uh, I think Mark has kind of touched this. So, so even if 15 events go great, uh, the 16th may not. Uh, what, what about the ongoing monitoring and maintenance? And, and for example, do you guys use uh, sensor APs or, or you, you know, dedicated 1800s or capes or stuff like that at the stadiums? And because and, it's such a different beast, right? So, I mean, obviously Aruba uses cape sensors. Uh, they're great great to you know plug there right product plug they're great to throw in the press area again because now i don't have to run up there when somebody says the sky is falling i can look at the cape sensor and be like uh you know i see that ssid it's fine everything's up it just helps multiply your guys that are on site you don't have a lot of guys to go run everything down so um and then trending too if you start to notice that uh, this AP always has 250 users on it, always has 250 users on it, and the AP next to it doesn't, you might want to go take a look at that AP's antenna or, you know, something's not right there. Do a, do a check, right? And it's good. You need to monitor these networks because if you don't, uh, you, you won't know what's good and what's bad because the vent, the, the, uh, a soccer game is different from a basketball game. It's different from an NHL. You know, all these different types of events, you kind of have to have an idea to know. Uh, when a basketball game's going on, I expect to see this much usage. When the soccers show up and there's no commercials and they're always going, usage is going to go down. Uh, you know, my numbers should be like this. You don't have a ch choice on making people associate or not most of the time. Oh. That just goes That's back to having a good baseline. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, know what's normal for your network. We, um, we're also, I mean, it's probably a little newer for us, but the 1800S um, dedicated sensor we're deploying uh, in all of our venues now. And I think probably the biggest thing there is, I mean, you can get um, to Marx's point, you know, some, some assurance that the network's actually up and somebody's not typing in the, the PSK wrong or something silly like that. Um, but that's one spot where um, Josh and I and some colleagues are spending most of our time because we feel like those things can, can do a lot more. So lots of uh, scanning and reporting type um, features on the way.
Yeah, I mean, they're great tools. The hardest part I'm having right now, Matt, is figuring out like, I want to put it in the bowl, but where am I going to put it to where it's going to simulate a client? I can't, if I put it under the seat, it's going to basically get attenuated. So that's, the, but that's my dream is to have it somewhere in the bolt as well. So I can say, Look, you know, speed <laughs> test. Yeah, that's a good point. It's possible. But if I have an AP in there though, I'm kind of SOL. <laughs> yeah. Man, you just got to go to all the games and just hold the thing. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and the it's, like ticket, it's like you take it to a game you just wear it around your neck and you battery power that thing and just show and it one out to every hundredth person that walks in and be like yeah just hold on to this i'm a problem solver man <laughs> yep by the way uc's paying us overtime by the minute so he currently has 22 minutes of overtime how much is is uh a minute again matt Six beers. Two, beers. Two beers a minute. No, six. It's six. Oh, six. Oh, God. I'm sorry. My agent says it's six beers a minute. <laughs> <laughs> my agent. I didn't know that's how CEX rolls these days. No, huh? no, no. Well, Josh always sets the bar super high. Like if I say, hey, we'll go out for just a little bit. It's never a little bit. Okay. Uh, time, time for the summary. Uh, let's say one bullet point per head. Marcus, you start. Oh. That's tough. Let's say uh, don't try to budget a uh, wife. Don't try to budget uh, the, the stadium, right? You got to know what your goal is. If you want to have high capacity Wi-Fi, don't try to, you know, have your budget shrink into it. Very good. Uh, Schwartz. Summary. Uh, I would say, I mean, high density Wi-Fi is completely achievable, but I mean, you have to, you have to use all the right tools to the best of your ability. I mean, that's pretty obvious generic statement, but I've seen lots of very poorly deployed networks where, you know, it doesn't matter the, the name of the vendor on the AP instantly, they're going to say, Oh, you know, vendor, whatever sucks when in reality it was just deployed horribly. Jeanette. Yeah, I'd say that really probably at the end of the day, and this has come out, I think, during this session here, is the success of the wireless network is probably more dependent on things that have nothing to do with Wi-Fi than it does with Wi-Fi. People talked about, you know, where you're allowed to build, where you're allowed to mount architect decisions. Uh, non-Wi-Fi devices, all that comes into play and setting expectations and explaining that to people up front the more they understand, the better you're going to be and the better network they're going to have. Very good. Dr. Jones. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, maintenance, you know, these, these networks, they're big, they're complex, you know, pay attention to the, the firmware updates coming from the vendors. Make sure, you know, if you're seeing bugs, performance issues, you know, <sighs> yeah you know look after your network i i do a lot of work where i go into venues and you see a lot of configuration creep and things like this where you you find something you go hey what's this doing you go, oh we we tried that for such and such to fix this problem but then we upgraded and now it's not necessary um you know again prime example i went into a venue a couple of years back and they had uh, broadcast filtering enabled on a cisco controller um because they'd needed it to fix some problem previously with a point of sale system and then features evolved in the software that meant that was no longer necessary and they just left it enabled without necessarily understanding the other ramifications that was having so very good and stefanik well i'm going to go technical on this one i'm going to say provide a high rssi negotiate a higher qualm channel isolation and reuse and most things will will be okay Thank you so much. Hey, I, I think we're done here, guys. Wow. And uh, I only owe you guys uh, 26 times six beers. What is it? 156 beers or something. You feel free to correct me. <laughs> I'll take those in San Diego in June. So you got time. Yeah. All right, man. <laughs> Maybe next week, Jesse. <laughs> yep, you got it next week, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so who's coming to WLPC? Marcus, you're coming. Uh, anybody else? No. No. All right. So, so I'll no. see. I'll see. Uh, 
you know, Mark is there, Will at Mobile World, I'll see Matt and Josh and team at, uh, and Leslie at Cisco Live, and Jeanette, uh, I guess I'll just have to make a visit to Silicon Valley to see you then. Come Unless, go for a drive. Hey, dude. Go for a drive. Re reconsider WLPC next week, okay? I'll see what I can do. All right, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for everybody. Thanks to everybody for joining. We we already at thirty minutes over the hour. We still had five hundred and and change uh, participants with us. So so you know, thanks for your persistence. Thank you, presenters. I owe you all one hundred and fifty six beers. Um, ciders are not an option, uh, but uh, but you can <laughs> upgrade to red wine. But that translates to a lesser amount of bottles. Okay. Thanks so much. The recording will be available soon. And uh, any closing words, anyone? Raise your hands. Great participating with everybody. It's good. Yep. To have yeah. Thanks, everyone. So. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, vendor panelists. Thank you, Will. Thank you, George. And uh, this was quite exceptional. I don't. Uh, have you guys ever been in a cross vendor panel anyway? First time, I think. Not like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like still propose we do the next one from a bar. Yeah. Just like, you know, deadliest catch after the catch, <laughs> sit around and have a beer. I mean, that's bring a, a white right there. I think I'm going to have to bring a lawyer to that one because my mouth will start coming loose. <laughs> like, like, I'm not, not talking right now. <laughs> okay, next, next, uh, next time uh, the title will be Beers and Lawyers. There you All go. Right, guys, have, have a good day. Uh, I'm off to get some, uh, get some sleep. Talk to you later, guys. All right, see you. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.